Thank you, everyone, for coming. It is definitely my pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, and thank you for, uh, in advance for uh, listening. Um, as Orla said, I represent uh, Badil Resource Center for Palestinian Residency and Refugee Rights. Um, I'd like to briefly just uh, alert you that we have two websites at Badil that you can go to for more information if there happens to be something that we don't cover here or, or we don't get to because of the time limitations. There are options for you to check out our websites. Our main website, www.badil.org, is where you can find all our resources. Uh, Badil, as a resource center, produces a wide variety of uh, publications and materials related to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict from uh, the perspective of international law and human rights, particularly as it, as it relates to Palestinian refugees and IDPs, internally displaced persons. The second website, www.ongoingnekba.org, is a uh, interactive uh, multimedia website. Um, it opens up with a historic map of Palestine. You can click on the historic districts of Palestine uh, and download uh, short stories and documentaries from the perspective of the victims themselves. So Palestinian victims of forced displacement are telling you uh, their story. And so it's, it's a lighter, uh, more humanistic view of forced population transfer. <coughs> the Deal Resource Center was established in 1998, uh, five years after Oslo. Uh, the term Badil in Arabic means alternative. And because the Oslo Accords uh, pushed the refugee issue to final status negotiations, and because after 23 years of Oslo we haven't even uh, been able to resolve the primary status negotiations. Uh, the deal was created as an alternative to uh, the political solution, which was Oslo. Uh, we are a Palestinian human rights organization, so our work is very focused in international humanitarian and human rights law. We present a legal analysis of the situation, uh, so it very much has a very legal uh, focus and perspective. Our current uh, strategic plan is advancing a rights-based solution by empowering rights holders and influencing duty bearers. We believe that change can only come about if we have the inclusion and participation of civil society, Palestinian civil society, and we are supported by um, uh, actions and statements from uh, duty bearers and uh, people in power. We have what is called special consultative status with the United Nations, and we've had this since 2006. Basically, it means that um, as a, an organization with special consultative status, the deal is allowed to participate uh, in various UN forums, including the human rights sessions. And so Badil has consistently participated in these sessions since 2006, presenting to the United Nations our research analysis <coughs> and statements. Uh, what makes Badil unique as a, uh, as a human rights organization is that we have a very comprehensive rights-based approach. Uh, we are not limited in geographic scope. Uh, we see the Palestinian population as basically divided into two groups, those that have been displaced and those who are about to be displaced. Okay? With regards to the element of time, we are not restricted by time either. Uh, a person is displaced, uh, regardless of when they are displaced, they are still displaced. So if we're talking about refugees from 1948, refugees from 1967, any time in between that and any time after that. Uh, the situation in, in uh, Palestine, uh, Palestine and Israel today is that there is ongoing forced population transfer. So even as we sit in this room today, uh, Palestinian refugees and IDPs are being created. So, let's going to switch slightly here and become a little bit more focused and talk about Gaza. Um, so, just some very basic facts very quickly. Uh, we're talking about 1.8 million people, uh, 365 square kilometers, uh, with a population density of 4,822 people uh, per square kilometer, which makes it, of course, one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Uh, an unemployment rate of 45.5%, and this is, of course, before the recent escalation in conflict. Two-thirds of the population are already refugees, okay? 
So two-thirds of the population were displaced to Gaza, okay? And of course, 70% uh, because of the very high uh, unemployment rates and the high uh, humanitarian crisis in Gaza, 70% are dependent on external or international aid. The blockade or the siege. Uh, I think maybe many of you know that the blockade is seven years old. Uh, we are talking about seven border crossings uh, surrounding the Gaza Strip. Uh, what's important to know here is that we're only talking about one with the Egyptian border and six on the Israeli border. So when we're talking about a lifting of the blockade or the siege, a complete lifting in the, of the blockade and the siege, which, mean, which would, would mean the lifting of restrictions on all seven border crossings. Uh, there is a fishing zone, uh, currently there is a fishing zone implemented of three nautical miles. Now if we take a look at this from, uh, from a historic perspective, uh, the Oslo Accords were supposed to allow the fishing zone to be 20 <coughs> nautical miles. The recent ceasefire agreement, not the one that occurred two days ago, but the one that occurred in 2012 that was brokered by the Egyptians, Israel was supposed to allow uh, the implementation of a fishing zone that was 10 nautical miles. Okay. Now this has really affected uh, the fishermen's ability in Gaza to be able to, to carve out a living in Gaza and also has reduced the ability of the population to supply itself with, um, with, with food and, and needs. And this is of course very important when you're talking about a siege because if things aren't coming in, they must be created uh, or produced locally in order to sustain the, uh, the needs of the population. There are nine refugee camps in Gaza, including one of the largest refugee camps in the world, uh, Jabalia, which has 110,000 refugees living in it. Now, Jabalia was very prominent uh, during the recent conflict because the UNRWA school that was uh, in Jabalia was targeted uh, and bombed by the Israeli military. Uh, there is a buffer zone that, that uh, is comprised of 24% of the Gaza Strip. Now this 24% of the Gaza Strip, as you can see uh, from the map on the wall, we're talking about the orange and red area. Uh, this 24% of the Gaza Strip constitutes um, approximately 50% of the arable or farming land of Gaza. So not only are they not able to uh, obtain their uh, dietary needs or some of their dietary needs from fishing, they're also not allowed to access this land, farmers are not allowed to access this, this land and use it for farming in order to be able to also supply uh, produce and other items uh, to the population. <coughs> if we took a look at the truncated sequence of events, uh, we're, what we saw in this past conflict was a lot of, uh, there was a blame game going on. Uh, it's Hamas's fault, it's the rockets, it's the kidnapping of the three settlers and uh, murder of the three settlers. Um, then we had uh, Operation Brothers Keeper in which Israel cracked down in the West Bank, uh, which resulted in the death of three Palestinians, uh, the closure of the West Bank and even more restrictions on movement. Thousands were uh, det uh, detained by the Israeli military with, with, without being charged and thousands of homes were invaded and lots of private property was, was destroyed. And then of course we had the escalation of hostilities, the reaction from Hamas and Gaza to fire rockets into Israel, and then of course Israel's reaction to um, Operation Protective Edge. Um, the statistics were given earlier, uh, uh, over 1,800 dead, uh, approximately 1,300 civilians. Uh, 408 children, 214 women. Um, on the other side, uh, the Israelis suffered 67 uh, losses, deaths. 64 were soldiers, Israeli soldiers, two were civilian, and one was a foreign national. Thousands of homes were destroyed, uh, which resulted in 65,000 people losing their homes. Also, over half a million were internally displaced. So half a million of the population of Gaza were, probably some of them were already refugees, so and now they were forcibly displaced again. 
Um, Israel keeps talking about their right to defend themselves, and according to international law, they cannot invoke this right. Uh, according to international humanitarian law, the occupying power cannot invoke a military attack against the uh, population that it occupies, the population that is, is under uh, its control. On the other hand, Palestinians' right to resist the occupation is sanctioned under international law. And that includes the spectrum of resistance from nonviolent resistance to armed resistance. Um, according to international law, there are certain uh, principles that both parties are obligated to respect. Uh, and those are the principles of proportionality, distinction, and effective advanced warning. Uh, proportionality is a military act is proportional to the situation at hand. Distinction is to make the distinction between civilian objectives, civilian <coughs> targets and objectives, and uh, combatants and military uh, targets. Even though, let's go ahead and suppose that uh, Hamas is shooting rockets from UNRWA schools. Now, we did hear that there were uh, rockets found in UNRWA schools. Uh, the schools where the rockets were located were empty, and the schools that were actually bombed didn't have uh, rockets in them. But let's go ahead and suppose that they did. Would this give Israel the authority under international law to actually bomb these civilian objects? According to international law, no. Um, it, they have to prove that any area that is to be attacked presents a military necessity. Okay? And so we have to ask ourselves, what kind of military necessity uh, could they gain from attacking or bombing a school or a hospital or even someone's private home? Okay. Now, they also claim that by giving effective advanced warning, they are impugning themselves or covering uh, themselves from being attacked or being um, uh, accused of violating international law. But the warning mechanisms that the State of Israel used for the, for the, popu the Palestinian population in Gaza is the roof-knocking method. And this is the method of dropping a smaller bomb on a target to warn people that a bigger bomb is coming. And usually after, there's a five second, two to five second interval between the first smaller bomb and the larger second bomb. So people living in homes would have this smaller bomb knock on their <coughs> roof and then they would have two to five seconds to evacuate the home before a larger bomb was uh, dropped on the same target area. Um, they distributed leaflets from the planes. So they would drop leaflets uh, down into certain areas, uh, letting people know that this area was going to be targeted. They would use phone and SMS, sing signal, uh, SMS uh, messaging. And they also issued thousands and thousands of fake warnings, uh, saying that they were going to attack a certain area and then they never actually did. Uh, all of these methods basically created an, uh, an aura of fear and terror within the Palestinian population living in Gaza. And so this explains to us, in addition to the actual bombing that did occur, why we saw so many displaced in this particular military operation as opposed to military operations of the past that have uh, happened in Gaza. Now, Evacuation during armed conflict is permissible, but the evacuating entity has to, come up to, has to adhere to certain uh, principles or certain restrictions. The first one, they have to show that the area being evacuated presents an imperative military necessity. Okay? And so we have to take all of these together. So all three of them have to be uh, applicable before the area can be evacuated. Um, and they must be able, the goal is to be able to contribute to the safety of the civilian population. And the evacuating force must be responsible for the welfare and return of the civilian population. So those 520,000 Palestinians that were forcibly displaced in the conflict 
are the direct responsibility of the Israeli government. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, who is taking care of these forcibly internally displaced persons? Mostly UNRWA, which is operating at very low capacity. Uh, the Jabalia School had over 3,000 uh, internally displaced persons inside. The capacity of UNRWA schools is only about 500. Take that in combination with the fact that there are no, they were go already going on a very low supply with regards to um, humanitarian aid and relief. So the, uh, the humanitarian crisis was compounded. Uh, take into consideration also the electric uh, station, the electricity station that was bombed and became completely uh, inoperable and you have a, a huge uh, humanitarian crisis on your hands. Again, we have to look at Israel's obligations under international law. And as I said, one of these obligations is the welfare and return of the civilian population. Okay? And Israel has completely failed, not only in this respect, in this particular time period, to see to the welfare um, and return of the civilian population, but they have also um, uh, denied this uh, responsibility since 1948, when the original uh, indigenous population of Palestine was displaced. So when we take a look at a map like this, which is entitled Palestinian Loss of Land from 1946 to 2010, uh, we need to see what is happening in Gaza within the larger um, uh, context. And we have to recognize that two-thirds of the population are already refugees. So they've already been forcibly displaced to Gaza initially. And now they're being internally displaced again. Um, and what we see here, or what we know, what we can assume from, from this uh, series of maps, is that every time an area that was green, meaning it belonged to Palestinians, turned white, meaning that it came under the control of the Israeli government, we have the creation of Palestinian refugees. Okay? And as you can see, uh, looking at the succession uh, of the maps, the green area is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, and the white area is growing and growing and growing. Uh, what we should not conclude from this map is that we're talking about very specific points in history. While during these specific points in history, <coughs> the waves or the number of people forcibly displaced were extremely high, so the waves would peak, but that does not mean that all of a sudden they would drop down to zero. We have consistent displacement throughout the period, and even though the very last map says 2010, as I stated earlier, from 2010 to this day, we have the creation of Palestinian refugees and forcibly displaced persons. Just very briefly, um, when we're talking about forced displacement on, under international law, we have a category called forcibly displaced persons. Okay? And this category, we have two subcategories, refugees and internally displaced persons, or IDPs. And the main difference between these two subcategories is geographic, or let's say logistic. If a person is forcibly displaced and they cross an international border, then they are considered refugees. So Palestinians that were forcibly displaced in 1948 and left what became the state of Israel, so they crossed the borders into the West Bank, Gaza, and the surrounding countries, those individuals are refugees. If a Palestinian was forcibly displaced and remained within the same entity, for example, what became the state of Israel, so they were displaced from Haifa to Nazareth, or from Nazareth to the Negev, okay? Those people are internally di displaced. The same applies for the situation in Gaza. They were displaced originally as refugees, and then within the current uh, escalation of uh, hostilities, they became also, in addition to that, internally displaced, okay? When we talk about forcible displacement, we have to recognize what constitutes force, and there's two types of force under international law, and Israel has used both types of force quite liberally. 
The first type of force is the force that comes from, international, from um, armed conflict, which we talked about uh, during uh, the recent escalation of hostilities, which also occurred in 1948 and has occurred sporadically uh, throughout uh, history or throughout the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, history. The other type of force that Israel also uses is a little bit more uh, difficult to see. And that's the creation of a situation that is so unbearable that it leaves the individual no other choice but to leave. So let's give an example. The fishermen from Gaza. It's their way of life. They fish, and this is how they make their living. This is how they support their family. If they are not allowed to practice their way of life, they're not fishing anymore, they're not able to support their family, then they have no choice but to leave. Unfortunately, because of the siege on Gaza, they are not allowed to leave. And then, of course, with the recent uh, escalation of hostilities, they were forced into other areas, so people from the sea moved a little bit inward, a little bit south, a little bit north, um, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, 66% of the Palestinian population are forcibly displaced persons. We're talking about 7.8 million people in total. 6.3 million are 1948 refugees. 5.3 are registered with UNRWA. So they registered uh, with UNRWA in 1948. Uh, 1 million are 1967 refugees. UNRWA keeps those categories separate. Uh, and they don't technically refer to those who were forcibly displaced in 1967 as refugees, even though according to the international law definition, they are. Uh, many of those uh, were people who were originally or displaced for the first time during 1948. And we're talking about over half a million IDPs or internally displaced persons, 360,000 360, living inside uh, the state of Israel and 170,000 in the OPT. Um, we can add, of course, the 520,000 uh, that were internally displaced inside Gaza. This sadly makes the Palestinian refugee population the largest and longest standing refugee population in the world. Um, the obstacles that the Israeli government faces or has faced in 1948 are the same obstacles that they face today. The obstacles have not really changed. Uh, Israel's solution to the obstacles are varied and many. Um, in order to make the statement true, a land without a people for a people without a land, uh, the Zionist movement and the Israeli government knew full well that Palestine was not a land without a people. <laughs> And so in 1948, they uh, developed what is called Plan Dalit, or Plan D, which is also a military operation that was carried about by the Zionist militias. So we can think of the Zionist militias at that time as the pre-IDF. Most of the leaders and soldiers from the Zionist militias eventually became uh, IDF commanders and uh, soldiers. Um, Plan Dalit basically had three uh, main mechanisms to forcibly displace. Uh, one is uh, the evacuation and demolition of uh, villages, Palestinian villages. Uh, one was massacres in, in strategic areas. Uh, and the other was the actual physical removal, putting people onto transportation vehicles and forcing them out either uh, on transportation vehicles or forcing them to walk to another um, location. After the forcible displacement in, that occurred in 1948, Israel passed the absentee property law and the present absentee clause uh, in order to deal with the second obstacle that the Israeli government faced. Even though they were able to remove 85 to 90 percent of the indigenous population through Plan Dalit, they still had to deal with the property rights of these individuals. And so in order to deal with the property rights of these individuals, they had the absentee property law. And this law basically states that even though I, the State of Israel, have forcibly displaced you from your homes, and even though I, the State of Israel, am responsible for keeping you from returning to your homes, I, the State of Israel, declare you to be absent. And as an absentee, you forfeit all rights to your property. 
And so the absentee property law was used to take control of all the property belonging to the refugees. And this law is currently being used, continues to be used by the State of Israel, but it was most widely used in 1948 because, as I said, they were able to forcibly displace 85% of the Palestinian population. Now, remember I said that there were IDPs, internally displaced persons. So there were Palestinians still inside Israel. They were forcibly displaced from their places of origin, but they were still in other locations uh, within the state. So they're present, correct? But how is the state of Israel going to deal with their property rights? So they created the clause present absentee, which of course is an oxymoron. You can't be present and absent at the same time, but according to Israeli lawyers and Israeli law, it's definitely possible. And this law states that even though you are present, I know you are here, I'm still going to declare you absent, and therefore you forfeit all rights to your property. And by using the absentee property law and the present absentee clause, the state of Israel was founded on 78% of historic Palestine. So they were able to take the lands belonging to the refugees and belonging to the internally displaced. Um, the land law or the, uh, the planning and zoning law, sometimes is what it's referred to, is another way that the state of Israel uses to appropriate or confiscate land from Palestinians. While on the surface, the land law looks to be quite neutral, um, the way it is applied is inherently discriminatory. The land law tells you what you can build, where you can build, uh, where the residential zones are, where the commercial zones are, where the public areas are, the military zones, and so on. So it looks like any other land law that you would find in any other nation state. However, it also tells you how to apply for and what are the requirements for obtaining building permits. Okay? And so Palestinians have to apply for permits and submit their applications to the State of Israel. And the State of Israel, of course, at that point would look and check the application and decide whether to approve or reject the application. How many applications submitted by Palestinians are actually approved by the State of Israel? It's about 1 to 4 percent, depending on the area. Okay? Uh, it's the lowest in Jerusalem, of course, in Area C, and it's a little bit higher in other areas. So without a permit, the state can then say that this is an illegal structure. Okay? This is an illegal structure, so this way it makes it legal for the state to confiscate the home, demolish the home, and appropriate uh, the land. The final obstacle is the... Um, is being able to bring the desired population to the area that you have just gotten control of. In the case of the State of Israel, we're talking about Jews from around the world, correct? So the state created the law of return. It's of course, very interesting from a Palestinian perspective, very interesting from Badil's perspective, because we are fighting for the right of return of Palestinian refugees. The law of return specifically states that any Jew living anywhere in the world, has the ability and the opportunity to come back to Israel and become a national of the state of Israel. How does... So the Israeli government was very effective with dealing with the three obstacles, just very briefly. The indigenous population, okay? The um, property rights of that indigenous population, and dealing with bringing in the desired population. But how does it hold everything together? How is the Israeli regime sustainable? How has it been sustainable for 67 years? Okay. And one of the main sustainability mechanisms that is used, or one of the main policies within the state of Israel that allows for this control is the Israeli nationality law. Now, as you can see, I have Israeli in quotes because in actuality, Israeli nationality doesn't exist. We have something called Jewish nationality and we have something called Israeli citizen. Okay? Now, as you can guess, in order to be a Jewish national, you have to be Jewish. So all non-Jews are then Israeli citizens, correct? Correct. 
Now, in most modern nation states, there is no differentiation between citizen and national. If you're a citizen of a state, you're also a national of the state. You're a citizen of Ireland, so you're a national of Ireland. Okay, I'm a citizen of the US, I'm also a national of the US. All the rights and responsibilities associated with being a citizen are the same for me as any other citizen or national. And the terms are pretty much interchangeable. For the state of Israel, that's not the case. So by implementing a regime of occupation, colonization, and institutionalized racism, by using laws that differentiate and establish a legal hierarchy for all Palestinians, the state of Israel is able to maintain control and appear to have the legal upper hand when dealing with the Palestinian population. Now, there are approximately 60 laws that differentiate between being a Jewish national and a Palestinian with Israeli citizenship. And as you can guess, the farther down we go to the pyramid, down the pyramid, we have less and less rights and less and less um, uh, adherence to international law. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail, but as you can see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six different categories of Palestinians. Now, I told you that Badil's perspective is, is that there are two, only two categories of Palestinians, those that have been displaced and those who are about to be displaced. International law is very clear with regards to the right of return. There are many conventions. Here's one slide. Here's another slide, and here's another slide, all speaking to the right of return. So it's not an issue of, okay, we have to create a law or we have to create some sort of treaty that deals with the issue of the right of return. No, the right of return is already there. It's very clear what the responsibility of the state is. It's also very clear what the responsibility and the obligation of third-party states are when another state violates international law. And so third-party states are obligated to protect the rights of the people who, who, whose rights are being violated. They're supposed to condemn the perpetrators of these violations. They're not supposed to render aid. Otherwise, they become complicit in the crime or the uh, violation and of course ensure the investigation of um, international crimes and gross. Um, one of the talking points of Israel, and I think this will be my last slide, um, one of the talking points is that Israel claims that they are being singled out. Why is everyone picking on Israel? I mean, we are the only democracy in the Middle East. Why does everyone have a problem when we kill, oh, 1,800 Palestinians? It's not like in Syria where we killed you know, where Assad uh, killed, I don't know, 100,000 or however many. So the question is, is Israel singled out? And I say that yes, Israel is singled out, but not for accountability, for blanket immunity. It doesn't matter how uh, inhumane or how much of a gross violation of international law the state of Israel commits, they are always not held accountable. And so the responsibilities and obligations of the State of Israel are not only do, does Israel shirk these responsibilities, the international community allows Israel to shirk these responsibilities. And in addition to that, the international community is basically carrying the burden of these shirked responsibilities on their shoulders. So who is paying for the care of the refugees? Who is paying for the care of the IDPs? How much money is funneled into humanitarian aid? How much funding is put into, um, not that I'm not appreciative, but organizations like TROCARE, supporting human rights organizations like the deal. So who is, who is paying for this? Not the entity that is supposed to be paying for this, but others. And the international community um, well, it might all, maybe they're doing it out of, you know, a noble goodness, but it also we have to understand that Israel has certain obligations and responsibilities. Israel has to be held accountable, and we can't have uh, blanket immunity, not just for the state of Israel, but also for any other um, entity uh, who is committing human rights violations.
Yeah, so I'm just going to briefly give you an input about uh, Troker's work in Gaza responding to the conflict. Um, so th this is an image here of a, a, a vigil that Troker held uh, in 2009 uh, in response to Operation Cast Lead, which was uh, three military operations ago in uh, in Gaza, uh, where over 1,400 Palestinians were killed. And the reason I put this up is because of this is history repeating itself. Um, if you're a six-year-old in Gaza, you've now, in your lifetime, seen three major uh, military operations. And I think this is what's quite heartbreaking. And I think a lot of people who are sitting in the room today will be shocked and appalled and uh, I think have their hearts broken by what they've seen on their television screens uh, over the last few weeks, it's really been shocking, uh, not only because what we've seen in the amount of civilians killed, but because this has been happening uh, almost at, 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 a, at a very regular pace of every two to three years. Um, and what we're re really worried about is in two to three years' time, we'll be sitting here again in the teachers' club, looking at the same images again, hearing the same stories. Um, it might be sooner than that. It might be tomorrow at the end of the season. It, it, it could be. You know, and we have a ceasefire at the moment, and hopefully it'll hold, but, but, but yeah, we, we, we don't know. Um, and what we do know is that if, if there's a ceasefire and there's an absence of violence, that's fantastic, but we, we need something deeper. We need a much more long-term solution, or this is going to happen again. Um, I've the privilege of working for Troca, managing our, our work on the ground with our partners such as, as Badil, and I regularly get to, to tra travel to Gaza. So I was just going to, to, to explain two, uh, two case studies of two families I've met in Gaza over the last few years. Uh, this is the Alashkar family. Um, in, in the middle is uh, Najoud Alashkar, and um, this family lost two of their sons during uh, Operation Cast Lead in 2009. Uh, very similar to what's happened in recent weeks. Uh, when there was a ground invasion of Gaza, uh, this family fled to a UN school uh, seeking shelter, seeking safety, um, but there was an attack by uh, Israeli um, F-16s uh, on the, the UN school. Uh, white phosphorus was used and two of, of their, their children were killed in this attack. Uh, Nijud herself actually lost her, her own hand uh, and she needs a uh, prosthetic uh, um, uh, hand uh, replacement, but she has been unable to access the, the necessary medical facilities within Israel because of the blockade on Gaza. Um, one of our partners in Gaza, the Palestinian Center for Human Rights, uh, took their case, uh, took a criminal complaint to the Israeli authorities, but there has, there's been no response from the Israeli authorities. Um, another case I wanted to mention was this man, uh, Mohammed Sharab, uh, is his name. He's actually uh, passed away in, in the last two years. Um, I met him in, in 2012 and uh, he told me of when there was a humanitarian uh, ceasefire in 2009, the same, uh, same attacks in 2009, uh, there was a truce uh, announced for a period of, of, of a few hours. Um, so he and his two sons left their, their home um, they, they badly needed supplies. There was, there was meant to be a cessation of violence for, for three hours, but while they were uh, driving to, to get some supplies, they were attacked by uh, a tank, the, uh, an Israeli tank, and they, they, they clearly showed that they were unarmed civilians, but uh, the tank opened fire on them, uh, killing one of his sons instantly. Uh, he was shot himself, uh, and his other son w was shot, and although they're only 300 metres from uh, a hospital, um, they were uh, denied leaving the area by the tanks and uh, his other son bled to death that night um, because they were unable to access um, medical facilities. Um, like clear violations of, of, of uh, international law here. Unarmed civilians being intentionally attacked and denied access to, to medical facilities. Uh, the Palestinian Centre for Human Rights uh, also took uh, a case uh, on behalf of the Sharab family, um, uh, they received a, a compensation, out of court compensation settlement with the Israeli authorities. Um, I think it was in the region of $100,000. Uh, uh, the Sharab family thought this was uh, very inadequate for, for the life of, of, of two of their, their children. Um, but this was a success. Uh, there was 1,400 people killed in Operation Cast Lead, and um, I think there was about four to five hundred cases taken by uh, our partner, and only two successful cases 
where there was compensation given. So this is a situation of complete impunity where there's a lack of justice for these victims. Um, and this has happened again. It happened in 2012 and it's happened again now in, in 2014. So we have a whole uh, set of, of victims again now. Uh, as uh, But Orla and Lubna said, uh, 1,800 uh, Palestinians have been killed. So, uh, yeah, 67 Israelis have been killed. Three of them were civilians and over 1,800 Palestinians killed. Uh, 86% of them uh, judging by preliminary estimates, were civilians. So the overwhelming majority of, of these victims are civilians. Um, I, and I wanted to just show some of the images of those uh, who have been killed in this conflict, um, because statistics you know, kind of dehumanise uh, the personal stories. So, I mean, here's uh, a number of images uh, taken from the Humanised Palestine Project. Um, just to show you, these are, are normal people, young boys and men, um, young women... Um, children who have all been killed in the last few weeks and it's, it's imperative that we, we achieve some sort of accountability and, and justice uh, for these people who have been killed um, so yeah, and, and Lubna has covered a lot of the statistics here, over half a million people displaced um, over 9,000 people injured uh, 10,000 houses destroyed uh, there's a huge humanitarian crisis and, and uh, the UN and uh, actors like Trokra and our partners need, need to uh, respond to this, this, massive, um, th this massive destruction really of, of Gazan society and infrastructure. Uh, we met with the Department of Foreign Affairs earlier and one estimate they'd heard was, was that it would take 30 years for, for Gaza to recover fr from, from this attack. Um, and he didn't know if that estimate would be a continuation of the siege? With the continuation of yeah. the siege, or actually with the borders, the seven border crossings open or partially open, he wasn't sure. So. Yeah. So, I mean, huge destruction and huge humanitarian crisis. There was a huge humanitarian crisis to begin four with, or five yeah. weeks ago, and this has just compounded, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what was already a, a huge problem. So, just to touch on Tropa's response, what we're doing also, I want to touch on what you can do as well. Um, I mean, it all sounds very, very hopeless. Um, but humanitarian aid can help. Uh, Troker is responding with, with local partners. Um, there's a huge need uh, of, the, of helping the, the health system in Gaza. Um, before the crisis, uh, there was a huge problem with stocks of, uh, of medical supplies, uh, drugs, um, blood supplies, etc., in the hospitals, and the conflict has only exacerbated that. So we're working to provide uh, medical supplies to facilities in Gaza. We're also providing legal aid to the victims of the conflict. Um, we're providing uh, counselling, psychosocial support. There's huge levels of, of trauma. The, the entirety of Gaza is, is traumatised from this conflict and from cycles of conflict and, and from the blockade. Uh, and we're also supporting local partners like Badil and uh, our other partners in Gaza to, uh, to seek justice, to advocate uh, for accountability uh, for potential or alleged war crimes that have happened uh, in Gaza. Um, but it's not just enough to, to provide humanitarian aid. Um, I think the international community has a huge role to play, and Lubna has already talked at length about this. Um, so Trokra has, has a campaign for justice, an ongoing campaign for justice. And what we're calling for is an immediate ceasefire. It looks like we have that. Hopefully it will hold. We don't know. It's just a 72-hour uh, truce at present, and there's negotiations ongoing in Cairo. Hopefully it will hold. And, and the, the troops have withdrawn from Gaza, so it looks like... Fingers crossed, at least there'll be cessation of violence. But we need a long-term political solution. Uh, as Lubna has been talking about, the, the roots of this conflict uh, go back to the displacement of Palestinians over the last uh, six decades. Um, and we need adherence to international law. Uh, we need an end to the Gaza blockade. If, if we're going to, uh, to see Gaza uh, repair and rebuild itself, we need Gaza to have a, a normal functioning economy, which means an end to the, to the blockade and to, to lift the siege. Um, we need an end to the occupation, the military occupation of uh, Palestinian territories and also settlements in the West Bank. We can't just look at Gaza in isolation, as Lubna has highlighted it in, in her presentation. Um, the fifth thing is we're calling for a ban on trade with settlements. This is something Troker has been calling for, for for the last few years. It's something that the Irish government, the EU, could do uh, to put effective pressure on Israel. Statements of condemnation are not enough. We need to look at real leverage, real pressure uh, on Israel, and trade uh, is something we can, we can look at uh, to put pressure on Israel. Um, 
And so what can you do? What can ordinary citizens do? And, you know, would hate you to just get depressed and walk away from uh, this room this evening feeling like the situation is, is hopeless. But there's lots that individual citizens uh, can do. I mean, you can support our emergency appeal. If you go to Troker's website, uh, you can donate online to our humanitarian response. Um, it was not just about money. Um, we can pressure our politicians. We have an online petition uh, on our website if you want to take that petition. Better yet, uh, write to uh, Charlie Flanagan, our new Minister for Foreign Affairs, or, or meet with your local TD. Uh, never under, underestimate the power of a handwritten letter. It can be very, very effective. Um, or use your consumer power. So you could uh, write to your local uh, supermarket. You could stop buying certain goods, like SodaStream, for instance, is, uh, is manufactured in an Israeli settlement. It's making a huge comeback. It's in a lot of stores like Argos and DID, Power City. Um, so you can call your supermarket uh, customer line to tell them that it's not acceptable uh, that they stock goods from Israeli settlements. Um, you can spread the word uh, online through Facebook, Twitter, blogging. Um, you could give a talk in your community, in your workplace, your university, um, or you could become an activist. Uh, you could volunteer with Trokra. Um, there's also been a, a whole series of protests and marches across the country in, in, in response and in shock and horror at what's been going on. Uh, I believe there's going to be a national demonstration this Saturday uh, in Dublin. I'd encourage you to attend. Um, there's a number of solidarity groups in Ireland. You could get active with them. Or you could volunteer in the West Bank uh, with EAPPI, which is a humanitarian accompaniment program uh, supported by Trocra. And I see there's a few uh, former uh, EA volunteers in the room here today. If, if you are interested in spending three months uh, assisting and observing and accompanying communities in the West Bank, um, please come and talk to myself uh, after the meeting. Um, and get creative. Uh, raise awareness, uh, media stunts, sport, music poetry, videos, uh, we need to capture the, uh, the, the public imagination, we need to channel our anger uh, and we need to, to raise awareness because we need to stop the cycle of violence and we need to not be in this room in, in two years' time.